Andy Bartelt was kind enough to comment on my paintings. He's professor of Old Testament theology at Concordia Seminary. He's an expert in Hebrew poetry and wrote a book titled The Book Around Emmanuel. Could you tell us something about the uh, Hebrew poetic structures that I try to paint? Well, what, what I find delightful about, about your work here is uh, the fact that it's trying to bring out um, not only the message of these chapters of Isaiah, but a bit about the structure of these chapters of Isaiah, um, which I believe are written uh, with, with a, um, a clear literary structure working in the background. It's something you don't necessarily appreciate until you, you get a little bit of a glimpse into the background. Um, and it's very orderly and what's called chiastic, that is to say that there's a beginning, a middle, and an end, and the end and the beginning tend to match each other. This, uh, the word chiasm comes from the Greek letter chi, which looks like an X, uh, so it's often either like an ABA structure or an ABBA structure, uh, and you sort of end where you begin. And that's a, a very uh, known and recognized feature of Hebrew poetry. There's a real vividness, there's a, an energy to this work. Uh, there, there, there's a sense of, of a little bit of randomness that, that I, I tend to like. I mean, here you have the stump, here you have Emmanuel, here you have the Assyrians, uh, uh, here you have the, the holy flame of the Holy One of Israel. Uh, and and the, the, the echo of the seraphim in chapter 6, these sort of fiery beings. Um, uh, uh, and you intersper here you have the lion uh, uh, lying down uh, with the lamb in chapter 11. And, and you brought together a, a lot of these motifs that are there in the text. Uh, you've, you've also added your sort of personal autobiographical touch. Uh, this, Jake, is, you remind me, this is the passport of your That's mother? the passport of my mother. Uh, she was five years in Sweden after the war, after yeah. she was liberated from Auschwitz. Uh, uh, that's a, that's a, t a moving uh, personal story uh, of your own uh, Jewish heritage and background uh, through that horrible time. And, and, and yet you've sort of brought that to bear, which kind of brings this sort of contemporary personal application. Yeah. I have come alive from this book. Okay. Mm -hmm. When was the large ghetto emptied? In 44. Yeah, you told me July 1944? Yeah, I think so, yeah. And from there, that's when you went to Auschwitz? Yeah, they take me to Auschwitz. I don't want it. Right. How did you travel there? Were you in a cattle car? Uh-huh. Could you describe what it was like when you arrived at Auschwitz? It was terrible. There were bad smelling of flesh. And I don't understand what the smelling was, but now I don't understand that they were smelling of burnt flesh. And, and we travel, 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 and we come to a place, Auschwitz. Work make you free. In German, something like that. I never... You know what the German kept secret with everything? Secret, secret. Everything was secret. I was in ghetto and I don't know what happened in the other town. You didn't know about the death camp? Auschwitz, and no, no, nothing. You didn't know at that time, okay. Didn't know, I didn't have to know anyway, so. Did you, how long did it take you to travel from Lodz to Auschwitz? Probably a holiday or more. And then I'll give us much food. Oh no, they were terrible. And I don't know what's going on. They, they take uh, people one side and the other side, one side and the other side. You heard about that before, did you? Yeah. Huh? Yes, I, I have. How do you call that? The selection? Selection, uh-huh. Yeah. Were you were you asked a question, or did they, or you just lined up? We were naked, and that's all. Were you still with your brother and sister at this time? No, no, my brother took they took him away before. When did they take your brother away? Some months before. While you were still in lodge. 
And could you explain the these uh, across the archway? The yes, uh, oh, oh, I think, and, and you've kind of made that the the keystone, if you will, uh, of your triptych. And this is the passage from Isaiah chapter nine. You've also got it in Hebrew here along the bottom. Pella yoeds el gibor aviad sar shalom. Wonder, counselor, God, hero, uh, father of eternity or at least perpetuity, uh, prince of peace. The most amazing part of Isaiah's prophecies is in Isaiah 9 when it speaks about the son of David coming to be the king, to sit on the throne of David and have an eternal righteous kingdom. And everyone knows it from Handel's Messiah. Unto us a son is born, unto us a child is given. And the idea of this verse is that the Messiah will actually be born, physically born. And then it says, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Father of Eternity, in other words, he's the creator, the author of time. These, these four groupings of two names there. And uh, what you've done on the top here is, is coded them, if you will, uh, in your painting in the colors between the gold and the green. Each pair uh, has what, uh, what many commentaries have, have, have sort of observed, that there's, sort of, there's a human and sort of a more than human, dare we even say divine, uh, nature to these names. Uh, Pella yoates. Uh, Pella is the Hebrew word for really sort of supernatural, uh, things that can't be explained by ordinary means. Um, and yoates means counselor. So most kings had counselors, but uh, not every king had or was a Pella yoates. The so, uh, however you translate a, that, a wonder counselor or a wonder of a counselor. Um, and uh, uh, the second name, El Gibor, in fact, a lot of people uh, assume that these are throne names. Uh, they're based on typical throne names of the ancient Near East, um, when in fact, uh, they go beyond your typical, every king called himself the grand something or another, the grand Puba, conqueror of the earth, uh, and all these sort of grandiose throne names. And in that sense, it fits, it fits the category but it's stretching the category. That's what I think Isaiah is doing here. I think Isaiah 9 is a bit of a parody on either a birth announcement or a coronation hymn of the royal son, but he's stretching the understanding and he's stretching the boundaries of how we understand the Davidic king uh, to move us in an area beyond just another son of David. In fact, in chapter 11, he goes back to the rootstock of Jesse, which is going back to the very beginning so that the, the king that he's foreseeing coming of the house and lineage of David is not just another son of David, but a new David. We're going all the way back to Jesse to sort of start over again. So back to these names, you get Peleoates, you get El Gabor. Now Gabor is the Hebrew word for a mighty warrior type. Um, and uh, that, that that's, uh, could be describing any human king or any human soldier, warrior, the king as the commander in chief, if you will, but he's called Ael Gabor, God warrior or divine warrior. Then the next set, um, Aviad, father, again, kings could be called the father, uh, uh, Aviad, but Ad adds this sort of perpetuity, this ongoing, this sort of once for all and forever understanding of father. And then Sar Shalom, Sar of course means prince, uh, and every king was at once a prince, uh, but this is uh, adding the prince of peace. And if you understand the biblical understanding of Shalom, we're talking about something far greater uh, than even the cessation of war on earth. You're talking about the restoration of created creation according to the will and the design of the creator with everything kind of working the way it's supposed to work in the right working relationships. That's what shalom really, really means. And that can't happen until the fundamental problem of creation is resolved, which is why biblical theology eventually leads us to an understanding of a new creation um, after the old has passed away. 
Now, having said all of that, let's go back to the four pairs. You'll see in the first two pairs that the so-called divine uh, is first, followed by the, so, the sort of human. So, uh, uh, Jake, you've, you've coated that with gold and then green. Uh, the same order is followed in the second pair, Eil Gabor, uh, the sort of God uh, term, followed by the man term. Uh, but in the next two pairs, that order is reversed, and if you actually laid these out in linear fashion, <laughs> you would see uh, that, uh, that that order is very clearly reversed. So the first line would read God, man, God, man. The second line reads man, God, man, God. Uh, and there's your reversal, A, B, A, B, but B, A, B, A in the second line, so to speak. So we have Aviah, the man uh, element is first, followed by God, and then Sar Shalom, again, man, God. Uh, this is very creative. I think deliberate, intentional, and well worked in the original poetry um, of Isaiah, and also very well depicted in just the way you've done this as, as uh, the sort of capstone and keystone uh, to this entire triptych. It's interesting that the two band pieces then sort of come together in the middle, and that's really at the, at the central point of all of this. And it's surrounded by the God pieces on the, on the other ends, right? So the, the humanity piece is almost framed by uh, the divine deity piece. And, so, and surrounding even that verse, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given like an introduction, and the government will be on his shoulders, mm -hmm. and his name will be called Peleia Eitz El Gibor Aviad Sar Shalom, Wonderful Counselor, Almighty mm -hmm. God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and the increase of his government and rule there will be no end. Those are like two... Uh, a government framing that whole That's very section. good, yeah. right, right. In fact, I, I, government is sort of the old English uh, King James translation. The word really means sort of the authority, the power, the rule. What word is that? Um, uh, I remember as a child, I, I always had this picture of the government upon his shoulders. What did that mean? He's looking around the, the throne or something? Um, it, it really means he's the, the uh, this, this has to do with the, the, the power, the sovereignty of God as the one who comes to be the kingdom of God. Remember, it was to be the kingdom of God all along, of which David was sort of the sub, the under shepherd of the great and good shepherd. Um, so what we have here is relating this uh, to the reign and rule of God over all the earth uh, that of course then comes in the one who was announced by that wonderful phrase, both by John the Baptist and by Yeshua himself, the kingdom of God has come near. Isaiah compares and contrasts a father and a son using two sections of his large book. The father and the son are two kings, Ahaz and Hezekiah. Ahaz is evil and Hezekiah is good. My brother Norbert posed for both kings. I used red to symbolize evil and white to symbolize righteousness. kings uh, were, were not the model kings you'd want. The closest you'd come is, of course, Hezekiah, uh, but um, he, he had his own problems, and of course there never was this Davidic king that turned out to be um, uh, everything that, that people had hoped for. But in relation to foreign affairs, the difference was quite dramatic. Um, uh, king Ahaz, as you may know, appealed to the Assyrians for help uh, against the threat that was being pressed upon him by the Syro-Ephraimite coalition. The north and Syria had allied against him. That's really the historical background of all of these chapters. Um, and Isaiah's concern with King Ahaz was that he is, had, had essentially acted in unfaith. Uh, if you do not believe, you will not be believable, he says in Isaiah 7-9, to play on the word play there. Uh, of, uh, of that's the Hebrew word amen. If you do, uh, if you will not be saying amen, you will not be amenable <laughs> in the sense of worth saying amen to. Um, uh, so Ahaz is sort of the, the epitome of a king who did not act in faith, while Hezekiah is, is a model of a king who did act in faith, both in his personal life, in humbly praying to God, uh, but also. Um, at least in uh, 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 dealing with the Assyrian threat that came in his day. Uh, and of course, God intervened, and you have that story of how the Snacker's army was dead on the doorstep of Jerusalem.
Jerusalem. While working on the Isaiah paintings, I've really been able to understand what Isaiah is trying to get at because he emphasizes his main points with his poetry. That makes it much easier for me to paint imagery that reflects the essence of his message. He uses color and gemstones and light and darkness so much throughout his poetry, and it is all pointed. The structure pulls these 66 chapters together like a symphony, and I'm quite intimidated as I try to paint these beautiful words. The way I've been able to explore the connections between my own story and Isaiah's poetry has been a blast. I love the smell of the turpentine and the process of laying the paint on in layers and scraping it off. It was the 70s when I went to art school and the abstract expressionists like Richard Diebenkorn and William de Kooning were painters I was influenced by. Larry Rivers helped me pull my method together when I saw his history of the matzo at the Jewish Museum in Manhattan. We were excited to purchase a portion of an actual Isaiah scroll, chapters 57 to 63. In my mind, this is the centerpiece of the Isaiah show. In the synagogue, Jesus was handed a scroll of Isaiah to read. He read from chapter 61. I will show you where that is on the scroll. Ruach Adonai, followed by God's name, then Mashach. Mashach means anointed or Messiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has mashached me. He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Heal the brokenhearted, set the captives free. This is connected to the right panel of my triptych, Nachamu, Nachamu Ami, because the theme of the right panel is the Jubilee. The Jubilee that Yeshua declares from Isaiah. I don't know if you noticed, but there's a, this, uh, uh, this is a toe. And this is a heel. And this is a, a foot of judgment coming down. And in Isaiah 63, it says, Who is he that's coming from Bozra? I've got Bozra written across here. I, I've used letter forms in the whole uh, in the whole piece. But that uh, judgment coming down, and it's also in uh, Revelation chapter 19. It's talking about the uh, grapes of wrath, you know, God's wrath or judgment coming down. These people that are in the wedding ceremony, the chuppah, are protected. And there's chuppah imagery in Isaiah chapter 4, 4, and it's this protective place where God has his people. He's going to be reunited with his people Israel in the future, and all Israel will be saved according to uh, Paul the Apostle when in uh, chapter 11 of, of the book of Romans. And in early chapters in the book of Romans, when he's talking about sin, he uses language from Isaiah 59. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me shall be for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. That's Isaiah 8:18. And it's the basis that I do four paintings in the Isaiah series. Um, Isaiah, Shir Yashuv, Prophetess, and Ha'alma. They're based on a self-portrait, and uh, that's Isaiah, myself. Uh, Prophetess is my wife, Jeannie. Ha'alma is my daughter, Eliza. And Shir Yashuv is Josiah, my son. 
I like painting the ones that are around me. It's a lot of fun, and God uses the children and Isaiah himself to get across the message that he wants to get across to us. Archaeology is a crucial element in the Isaiah series. I asked Janie Rosen to comment on the archaeological aspects of the Isaiah series. She teaches art history at Linenwood University. The Assyrians were a fearsome nation that threatened the northern and southern kingdom of Israel during the 8th century BC. Between 738 and 732, Tiglath Pileser III launched four campaigns against the ten northern tribes. Finally, in 722 BC, Sargon II finished off the city of Samaria, deporting some 30,000 inhabitants. In 701 BC, Sennacherib, another Assyrian ruler, was moving against the southern kingdom of Judah. About 30 miles south of Jerusalem was the large inhabited city of Lachish. This relief, found in the ancient Assyrian city of Nineveh, is now housed in the British Museum. The relief Jake portrays here is the siege and total destruction of the Jewish city, Lachish. The Assyrians were powerhouses of destruction. Here, Assyrian soldiers work a huge chain that intersects with a battering ram further over here. That was used to tear down the walls. Archers surround the double-walled city of Lachish. You can see victims falling from the walls. Despite the fortitude of this important city, it fell to the Assyrians. Jake reproduced this sculptural relief of Cyrus the Great, located at Pasagarde, not far from the ancient royal city of Persepolis in present-day Iran. It appears to be a composite of several ancient civilizations that the Persians would have either conquered or had dealings with. The wings are a Persian symbol of divinity, and the stance is a stiff Egyptian profile. Isaiah 45.13 says, I will raise up Cyrus in my righteousness. I will make all his ways straight. He will build my city and set my exiles free. Isaiah's prophecy foretells of the great conqueror and king of Persia, Cyrus the Great, who God would use by issuing the decree in 538 BC, allowing the Jewish people to return from their 70 year captivity in Babylon. The remarkable thing about Isaiah's prophecy is that it was written nearly 200 years before the event actually occurred. 